G'day everyone, um, we'll just start now, I think. Um, hi, my name's Sam, um, I'm from Melbourne University down in Australia, um, part of the Nectar project. Um, this is a, a kind of a three-part talk. There's myself, uh, we've got Valmero here from CERN and um, Matt here from Rackspace, so we're just going to give you um, a bit of a talk about sales and scaling OpenStack. Um, we gave a talk in Paris um, six months ago, um, so this is kind of a bit, a bit of a follow-on from, from that talk. Um, so for people who are there, we'll hopefully have something different to tell you. <laughs> um, uh, um, so ne Nectar is uh, the project that, that are, I'm part of in Australia. Um, it's a um, government-funded project that started in 2011. We've, Started uh, early cloud and uh, on the Cactus branch, and um, kind of started uh, production in Diablo, and we've um, been slowly upgrading ever since. We're mainly on Juno now, a um, few ice house nodes around. Um, we're, we're kind of a part of a federation, as you can see. Um, we've got eight eight sites um, around the country that are kind of geographically dispersed. Um, where we've got uh, lucky enough in the, in the research network, we have uh, big networks, so we have a kind of a big pipe uh, between the, the data centers. Um, um, so we, we, we use sales to, to, to really um, join up all these, all these sites around Australia. Um, the, the reason we kind of went for sales is, is there's really you know, a couple of ways you can scale OpenStack. One of them is, 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 is regions, and the other one is kind of scale is sales. Um, we wanted to have a single endpoint for our users. Um, you know, we have most of the users on our cloud are, are researchers and scientists. They're not all IT professionals, so we wanted to give them a nice, simple interface. We want, you know, single set of security groups, single set of key, key pairs, um, and you know, just just one central front door for everyone to kind of go to and, and use our cloud. Um, uh, you know, one of the other reasons that I, we see as an advantage of using sales is the, um, I guess the. the the OpenStack expertise or the lack of the, the OpenStack expertise that we have. And so we can kind of have a, have a core team um, in, in one location, like handling all the um, central um, you know, APIs and things. And, and really, each of our sites around the country, they all need to just deal with the compute nodes and, and, and a small subset of OpenStack. You know? So that really um, is, is another reason that we, we go for sales. Um, um, how, how, how big is Nectar? We're, um, there's eight sites of us around the country. You know, we're, we're growing pretty, pretty rapidly still. Um, we're, we're currently about at our final deployment in terms of size. Um, there's around 700 hypervisors. Um, so, you know, we have around about 100 or so per cell. Um, yeah. So, and I guess we're not as uh, big as these guys, but, you know, in terms of how we scale our, our system, but we, um, I think we're decent size, um, and, and size of people as well. We, we, I guess we're a small team. We have three people running everything locally, maybe less than that. Um, we have a high staff turnover, so um, that, you know, as everyone does, I think. Um, interaction with other services. We have, in terms of with ourselves, we have you know, other OpenStack um, systems involved. Uh, we try and have a, a swift region in each each cell, um, and then we can use uh, local Glance APIs to then uh, feed feed our Nova. Um, so you know, especially when we're um, quite geographically dispersed, having a you know a local um, object or a local local image really is the main thing for booting is, is quite important to us. Um, you know, we have we also have Cinder around the, the cloud. Most of well, all of our cells have a will have at least one Cinder volume host. Um, we you know we're using different backends at each you know. Um, all of our cells are, are, are the same, but quite different. You know, it's up to the each site to, to determine what you know vendors and stuff they use. Um, so, Solometer is another thing that we we use um, uh, to varying success at the moment. Um, we have a large Mongo cluster, and we really just kind of fire everything up to it. Um, some things work, some things don't. Um, 
we're we're a Nova Network um, installation. So we've, we, you know, we, we, when we started, there was only Nova Network, and we're still on Nova Network. Um, we do have a, a, a kind of a big network around uh, all ourselves. So in the future, we might be able to leverage that when we're moving to to Neutron. Um, in terms of our, in terms of actually what we run on each cell, that, that this, this is just a list of, of um, everything we run. You know, um, APIs at the central level, and you know, just really just the compute stuff going on at the at the cell level. Um, one of the one of the uh, things that we really need to deal with is scheduling in terms of cells. Uh, where do we where do we put instances? Um, we have. Uh, you know, geographical requirements. We have users that want to schedule at a certain cell, or for us, uh, an availability zone. We we kind of use the cell term as an internal thing uh, for scaling, and we use the availability zone as a user thing. And you know, they kind of match up one to one in terms of a cell and a zone, but not necessarily. Um, and, and so you know, users can choose where they want to launch their instances. Um, and you know, now we're doing. Uh, we have some cells that are, we have a, a a test cell, I guess we call it, um, that we you know only let certain tenants on. We use filters there. We uh, we have some cells that are you know have higher um, performing nodes, GPUs, fast I/O, things like that. So you know we use, we use the same things that in a, in a non-cell environment we use um, aggregates and, and flavors really to determine where those instances are scheduled. Um, you know. Um, another thing to do with scheduling is when we, we bring on new cells, it's one of the, um, it can be quite an issue. Um, we want to, uh, you know, test out, out this new cell before we, we open it up to the public. Uh, we don't want to, we don't want to flood a new cell, you know, when we bring on a new cell, part of the scheduling is, you know, how much RAM is available. And so if you bring on a, a new big cell, everything's just going to port it at. And if you've got a faulty new cell, then, you know, it's, it's, it's even worse. So um, we use a few techniques there to, to kind of slowly uh, bring on a, a new cell, we will start off with having it restricted to only certain people. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll kind of treat it as a pre-production. We'll have beta users on there, um, and then slowly we'll, we'll open it up uh, into the global scheduler, so we kind of have a, a nice smooth on on ramp. Um, we, we also run a, an open stacks um, system to manage all our infrastructure, um, which has been something that we did just before Paris, I think. Um, and it's been quite, a, quite important to us and, and it's really like made it easier for us to deploy the infrastructure. We've got so much infrastructure now that we need a cloud to, to, to manage that and it's been really helpful for us. Um, everything is mainly virtualized in terms of our, our control infrastructure. We have you know physical databases and, and rabbits, uh, but everything else is pretty flexible. And that really helps when, when upgrading. Um, I think uh, we've kind of got a process now when we do our upgrades. Um, we've just um, almost finished the upgrade to Juno, so we have about half our cells are on Juno and half of them are on ISOS. Um, we've kind of got a process of you know doing conductors and, and APIs and that. And, and the last, uh, I think at least the last two, two um, Upgrades we've have, had have been non-impacting to the users. Um, you know, we can kind of do a cell at a time, and, and you know, um, rolling upgrades is just a lot easier. Um, monitoring in terms of cells, we because we are a, we're a kind of a federation of different organisations. You know, we don't have the same people that, at each cell, and so really the, we have to have a, the, the firm interactions between the rabbit servers and, and cells. So that's where their their kind of contract is. You know, we send a message to your rabbits, and it's it's really up to them to to deal with that and how the instance gets scheduled or you know how the request gets handled. And, and so, having strong monitoring around that interaction is, is quite key for us, um, and, and and vice versa. So you know, there's some requirements. You know, we have to make sure that we, our, our our system is very highly reliable. Um, and, and and one uh, one of a good good tests is really just the console log. Um, you know, spin up an instance in, in, in all of your cells and do some monitoring on the console log. And it's, it's, it's a, because it's a call, you need a response. It's a, it's a good way of actually testing all the functionality that cells does. But, good point. Um, the, future, the future is that we're, we're, we're looking at Neutron at the moment. Um, you know, uh, Nova Network has got a, 
undefined future, and I, th I think you know we th we think Neutron is the way to go. Um, we there is no real differences in terms of with cells. There's a few little things that we had to make work, but really um, Neutron can work in a cells environment without any changes. Um, we uh, we're looking at because our networking is very simple. We just have a single flat network, public IPs everywhere. Um, it's, it, it's, it's probably a simpler migration for us to move to Neutron. Um, once we're at Neutron, we're hoping to get some more of the fancy you know, tenant networks and load balancer service and some of those high-level services. Um, but that'll be a slow progress, I think, and, and you know, throughout the ne this coming year, we, we hopefully we'll get there. Um, you know, we're looking at other other services. I mean, all, all the other services really that are high level don't really interact or don't need to know about sales, which is quite nice. You know, it's it's, it's a Um, I think that's all I've, <coughs> all I've got. Yeah, and I'll, I'll pass over to Bill Miro. So, thanks. Um, so, my name is Bill Miro Moraira. I work for CERN. So, what is CERN? CERN is the European Organization for Nuclear Research. It was created in 1954. It has 21 member states and uh, is located in the border between France and Switzerland near Geneva. CERN's mission is to do fundamental research. Um, and is the biggest international scientific collaboration in the world. We have 10,000 scientists from more than 100 countries that uh, work at CERN. For the scientific research, CERN operates a network of particle accelerators and detectors uh, that uh, they are used by several experiments. One example is this one. This is the Large Hadron Collider and is the most powerful and largest accelerator in the world. It's a circular accelerator. It has a diameter of 27 kilometers, and it sits 100 meters in the ground Geneva. When in operation, the detectors that are connected to the Large Hadron Collider can produce one petabyte of data that needs to be filtered, stored, and analyzed. To analyze all this data, CERN provides computer resources to scientists all around the world. And to help us on that, we now provide a cloud infrastructure based on OpenStack. So six months ago in Paris, I presented uh, what was the, the motivation of CERN using cells. And now I'm going to give you first a perspective. What, what is the state? What change? And now what are some problems that we are facing? So the cloud infrastructure is in production since July 2013. We are now running Juno. We finished the upgrade three weeks ago, and we started also offering it to, to our customers. We have two different virtualization technologies in our cloud. We have KVM and also Microsoft Hyper-V. And we're starting upgrading all our scientific Linux 6 nodes to CentOS 7. The reason for this is to continue to use the OpenStack distribution packages. Uh, our cloud runs in two different uh, data centers. One is located in Geneva, the other one in Budapest. And in terms of numbers, during these six months we had a few more nodes. So now we have 120,000 cores in our clouds. In average running we have 11,000 VMs and in total we have 16 uh, cells. We also changed the way in these six months how we deploy cells. Now our new cells have around 200 nodes. And this means that if they are smaller, we're going to have a lot of them. However, if one fails, the impact in the, in the infrastructure is not so, so big. Also means that with smaller cells, we can have smaller control plane, uh, which is much easier to bring back in case of failure. For this reason, we now are not clustering rabbit at the uh, uh, child cell level. Uh, in fact, most of our problems in the past were related with network partitions in our rabbit clusters. Different cell types have different requirements. We have what we call three cell types. The compute one for CPU intensive tasks, for example, LHC analysis. The, the service cells that run web servers, databases, so on. And the critical ones that run very critical applications that we have, like the radiation control systems. 
Um, now we map one availability zone to a cell. This means that a cell is only uh, one availability zone. We don't use aggregates anymore in our infrastructure. It turns out if you have thousands of nodes managing aggregates, it's really challenging. We still have big, big cells, the ones that we set up two, two years ago. Uh, we have cells with 800 nodes. One th uh, our biggest one has 1,700 nodes. We are looking how can we split these cells? Uh, possibly a po uh, next talk, next <laughs> summit. So, last summit, I told you about the, all the motivation, problems, and challenges that we have at certain running cells. So what I want to, to do today is go through some of those problems and tell you how we are dealing with them. The first one is to prune over databases. So during these two years, in our cloud, more than one million VMs were created. Of course, we don't have resources to host one million VMs at the, uh, in one go. So for new ones to be created, uh, others need to be deleted. In average, we have 11,000 VMs running. With a creation deletion rate between 100 to 300 VMs per hour. Um, and over time, of course, the databases will grow. And this is not only a problem if you are running cells, but if you are running cells, you multiply this problem by the number of cells that you have, because each one has a database. The problem is that when you delete an instance in Nova, it's only soft deleted in the database. All the information is preserved there. At certain, we have the policy to preserve this information at least three months after the instance is deleted. After that, we can uh, forget this information. We can delete it completely. So how can we do this? So Nova has the ability to archive deleted rows. However, for our use case and using mm -hmm. cells, this is not really ideal for us. So we needed to build a small tool, basically, that goes to the top cell, to the parent cell, checks out all the instances that are deleted uh, before a specified date, and then removes all the records related to that, those instances, and then goes to all the child databases and delete exactly the same instances that they have. So in, the, in this case, we keep consistency between both databases. When we delete, we really remove one VM from the top one, we also remove it from the child. Well, all the code is available on GitHub. You can have a look. And also, I wrote a small blog post explaining more how this works. So next, cell scheduling. So we have different cells. Each cell has different requirements because we have different hardware different location, and the network configuration in those cells are, are different, different hypervisor type, uh, type, so on. So how can we make sure that a VM from a project is scheduled to the right cell? So child cells have the, cap the capacity to expose to the parent one capabilities. So we use that feature, basically, to inform the, the, Nova, cell, the Nova cell scheduler the capabilities that the child have and also we use metadata that the user can provide when it boots an instance. The other thing is Nova Scheduler, the Nova Cell Scheduler has the same function as Nova Scheduler. So it supports uh, scheduler filters. So what we did was to build a set of scheduler filters, like the selection of the data center, select an availability zone, the hypervisor type, and map a project to a cell um, to help us on this. So it, the code, again, is available on GitHub. You can use it to, to write your own uh, scheduler filters. Probably uh, it will be a good help on that. Flavors management. So because different cells have different requirements, the projects that run at CERN, all of them have specific needs. So all, all of them need special flavors. So how can we manage different flavors per project in a big infrastructure? Uh, unfortunately, we cannot use Nova API directly because when you create a flavor using the, the Nova API that is connected to the parent cell, 
the flavor is only created there. It's not propagated to the child ones. Of course, you can think, well, but uh, we can also run of API in the child cells, as we do, and uh, I can use of API individually in each one. That doesn't work because the hacker ID, that when you create the flavor in the top cell, could be different in all the childs. And then you create a big mess because you think that you are starting a VM from the, the flavor small, and in fact, you are creating a completely different flavor. So initially, what we did was, was going through the databases and add all the flavors individually on them. But since we're starting to add more and more cells, it starts to be risky and difficult to manage. So again, what we did was a small script that goes through all the databases, selects a free hacker ID, and uses that and propagates the flavor in all the, the cells available. The trick here is to add the flavors in the child cells as public. If you do that, then all the management could be done in the parent cell. So if you remove it, then you don't need to mark this in your child cells. Or if you want to dedicate the flavor to a project, then you only need to do this in the parent cell. Again, you can check out the code on GitHub. So increasing the number of cells also increases the challenge of keeping everything working. So how can we make sure that our cells are performing uh, well uh, before and after being deployed into production? So for this, we are starting to look into Rally, so for benchmarking and also test functionality. We have multiple scenarios, basically, for the basic fun functionality. For example, create and delete a VM uh, using Nova and EC2 API, for example. And uh, we integrated all of these with our Kiban infrastructure. The reason for this is that the UI that, the, that Raleigh provides doesn't give us a historical view about the, the running tests. You only see the iteration. So we integrated this with Kibana. And for now, we don't have alarming, but it will be nice in the future to have some kind of notification if a test fails, a scenario fails. Uh, we are looking to do this, and probably we will use Spark for this. So this is one example uh, about our integration um, with Raleigh and our Kiban infrastructure. We can see that in this example, we have three cells and uh, different uh, scenarios here, and we can immediately identify in the it, it map that we have which is running, which is failing. And you see that we have this per hour, uh, something that the Rally UI at the moment doesn't provide us. Well, Cern Cloud doesn't look as bad as it looks here, okay? Also, we can go deeper on this and see the duration of the scenario. And what was the duration of each individual operation? So for example, in the first case, to boot a VM and delete it, it was around 29, 28 seconds. And you can see that most of the time here was to boot the VM and then to delete it. OK, so I hope that this will help you when you are deploying your cloud infrastructure using cells. So next, Matt will talk about cells at Rackspace. So yeah, so just to give you a little background, so I work with our fleet management group at Rackspace, so I have several engineers that are tasked with sort of automating both the physical and the virtual nodes that make up our cloud, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, as we go through. Just quick background, so managed hosting um, company, it's been around for a while. Um, at this point, we have over 200,000 customers in um, 120 cu countries around the world. Um, from a cloud perspective, we're still running six basic regions. Um, that span these particular locations. That hasn't changed yet. Um, tens of thousands of hypervisors, you can read the rest of the details, um, growing all the time. I have one of the nice luxuries uh, in that I have this constant stream of gear headed my way uh, because we use it to make money. So I know a lot of people struggle with capacity. Um, our struggles are keeping up with the flow of capacity coming in in a lot of cases. Most of our cells, uh, the deployments run anywhere from three to just still about mid-30s, I think, in our largest regions, as far as number of cells in a region. Uh, and that's largely dictated by the size of the data center we have in each place um, and the, the growth of customers in those places. 
Um, we size about 100 to 600, not so much on the, the 600 side anymore. I think that's when we first started. Some of our original standard flavors got about that high. We actually found some problems with broadcast domains if tenants started doing bad things. Um, so that and some and sizing of our IP blocks for our internal network that connects different products, we've kind of brought that down a little bit. So most of them now run about 100 to 150 with our newer newer hardware mo models. We have. We break up cells um, really based on hardware more than anything else. Um, we offer several flavors to our customers. Uh, some of the names are on there, the general purpose, the HIO, uh, compute optimize, all those things. We'll have multiple cells of each of those in a particular region, but that's the primary way that we uh, break up our hardware. Um, we are working on exposing some additional constructs around that, uh, maintenance zones, so the idea that I can schedule instances near or far from each other uh, within certain flavor types um, so that when we have to go do work, we're not necessarily bringing down um, everything at one time. Uh, we do run a separate DB cluster for each cell. Um, the other thing I'll point out, I think uh, Sam mentioned they do the same thing. We run all of our control plane in an OpenStack cloud itself. Um, we actually use cells within that one as well. There's for two reasons. One, we have multiple hardware types now uh, available in our internal cloud. Secondly, we offer some of that space out to other groups at Rackspace to do their own testing or development work. Uh, and so I want to make sure I can isolate the things that the, the instances that represent my control plane for the public cloud from, say, an IT group who's testing, you know, a new version of the billing system. Um, and so to do that, we use some of the same techniques to isolate um, cells within this private cloud to, to individual tenants. Cell scheduling, like I said, multiple uh, cells within each, within each flavor class. Um, also, we have in most cases, multiple vendors in some of our different hardware types. And so we try to keep a cell uh, homogenous from a vendor perspective, just so there's, there's no quirks there. Uh, this is especially important for matching the CPUs exactly. Uh, we are starting to use live migration more and more for internal maintenance work. And this is, this is block live migration. So this is not with attached storage. Um, so as we try to make that more and more transparent for customer standpoint, um, we just don't want to run into problems with, with CPUs not matching exactly, so that's why we, we keep hardware as homogenous as possible. Um, and then within each flavor class, you're going to have different flavors offered, much like um, Lermo talked about where the, the child offers up the flavors it supports. Um, so for example, in our general purpose offering, we offer a one, two, four, and eight gig flavor, flavor within that class. Um, tenants are scheduled by flavor class fir first and then by available RAM. We don't schedule on any CPU information. It's purely on RAM right now. Everyone in that flavor class gets the same vCPU allocations for the class. Um, I would like to have scheduling based on IP availability. I'll talk a about how we get around that now, but that's probably the one other thing I would love to see from a scheduler perspective um, because sometimes those two things don't line up well. Um, and then just to point out, there is a lot of work going on with Cells v2 around Scheduler itself. Uh, this is one of the, the, uh, the blueprints out there. Uh, there's about three, I think, on Wednesday when we have the large deployment team working group. One of the sessions we're going to dive into Cells v2 blueprints. Um, and so this is one of them that we're going to dive into. Just has to do with, with, with uh, where Scheduler starts updating some information about the instance earlier in the process than where it does today. Um, but you can dive in more if you want to read up. Um, so deploying a cell, pretty similar. Um, we run everything, like I said, uh, in, a, in a cloud. So we, we, we lay down the control plane with an Ansible playbook, um, the DB pair, the cell service, scheduler, rabbit, the key pieces. We're still t testing out uh, conductor, so we don't have those integrated yet. Uh, we run a playbook as well that populates the, the, the same flavor stuff that uh, we talked about earlier. Um, and then we run a separate playbook that, that bootstraps our hypervisors. One thing I'll point out here, and I'll talk more about it on um, Thursday in another talk, but we actually run our compute nodes as a VM. So um, from a node perspective, that gives me twice as much to deal with and, and, and extra headaches. But it's a nice isolation piece. So worst case, I can blow away my compute node and not affect the underlying instances except for you know, taking action against them. So the bootstrapper, in our case, pretty much is responsible for getting that VM created, getting the updated code pushed on it, laying down a, the right version of OVS on the hypervisor, some of those things, and then pushing routes and whatnot that we need to talk to other Rackspace products. Uh, after that, we provision IP blocks, we test, and then we link it up through another playbook, which you mentioned getting the, some of those things backwards. We've actually had one case where the, the Ansible assumed things in a way we didn't realize at one time, and so it actually linked up one cell as the global and caused some interesting shenanigans as things tried to schedule to the wrong place. So 
that's almost as dangerous as the flavor classes getting advertised wrong. All right, so we too had to deal with purging the DB nodes. Um, we had we were a little bit further along than, than CERN was when we started messing with it, but just to give you an idea, so our largest uh, regions right now are running over, up around or over 50,000 50, VMs at the moment. Um, in some of those regions, though, we have thousands of VMs being created and deleted in an hour. Uh, in fact, I would tell you that a lot of that is y'all's code submissions to OpenStack drives a lot, that in some of our regions. Um, so obviously we start stacking up those deleted instance records pretty, pretty heavily. We also have a 90-day retention period for deleted instance information. And I looked this morning, even in my small regions, I'm still sitting on about 132,000 deleted instance records and all the metadata to go with them um, in that 90-day period. So, but what does that mean? Well, here's an example of the API latency in one of our larger regions. You can see that back in November, it was running, you know, we kind of reached a tipping point where it was starting to, to slow down a little bit. Um, and then that sharp drop at the end was us successfully purging all the global deleted instances as well as um, the cells. And I see Jesse sitting out there now, so he, he remembers those days. Um, so anyways, there, there are benefits beyond just the data that, gets, that you get taken up. You can see uh, actual API improvement getting all that stale data out. Um, testing our cells. So we also have to figure out how to test cells that are being added into a working environment all the time. The primary way we test a new cell is with a, with a bypass URL. Essentially, you, you just add an API node. In our case, we use, it, we, call it, we use an admin API node. Supports a few extra functions. But we add a separate API node temporarily from the time we finish provisioning the cell to the time we link it up. And all of our QE tests are run against that API node. So we're not actually having to, to put it into production, so to speak, um, until we're comfortable with it. The trickier part is when we're adding additional capacity to an existing cell because there's just no concept from a host perspective of I'm sort of kind of in production, but I'm not really ready for prime time. Um, so there's some things we can do. There's targeting filters, all those kinds of things. Um, we actually have a change. I wasn't able to find the code. My schedule's off uh, after all the Venom shenanigans last week, but uh, a couple of my engineers are working on a filter that will actually modify the targeted host filter to, to still build even if the host is disabled. And so our hope is that we can use that to actually get uh, all of our host provisioning completely hands off. Our goal is hopefully by this year, a cabinet can roll in and be turned on. And as long as the network switch is configured, everything from thereafter, from installing the operating system, which is Zen server today, to all the bootstrapping, to all the testing, to all the linking up happens, hopefully hands free. That's our goal is this year, we'll see how far we get. Um, and so we're gonna need those host, host based hints to work even on disabled hosts for that to happen. Um, the other big thing that I thought I'd bring up from like sharing uh, pain and agony is the concept of disabling a cell. It does not exist. Um, you're kind of linked up or you're not. And when you're unlinked, there's a lot of problems for the existing instances that live there. Um, the reason this is important to us is actually IP space. I mentioned this earlier. So we've actually had uh, cases where um, the amount of available IPs depletes faster than the amount of available RAM, um, which isn't a big deal, except that unfortunately right now at Rackspace to get additional IP blocks added, does require manual steps by other teams to go update routers and whatnot. Uh, I, haven't, I don't have the ability to completely do that programmatically. Uh, and so used to, what we would do is we would just, we have a resolver service that picks up alerts and handles them for us. And it would just go in and it would add, a, it would add an offset of a big number, right? Um, and that works most of the time, but there's still cases where a brand new cell had so much available capacity that even with an offset or even with the weight high, it would win the calculations and it would just keep hammering that cell with builds. Um, and so what we did was we, cook, we cooked up, and this is kind of a dirty hack right now, we're trying to come up with a better way, but we cooked up a special filter that instead of specifying a big value, we specified a specific value. So we, anytime we now put minus 42 on a cell, our scheduler knows, don't send anything, stop what I'm doing, move on, go somewhere else. Um, so I pasted the, the, the bulk of that code in here, the slides will be up later, I think we'll post them, yes, yeah. Um, again, it's not, it's not the cleanest way to do it, but it allows us to then allow to have that same resolver service pick up an IP alert, drop the minus 42, or for any reason, if we detect any massive anomaly in a cell, our ops guys can go in and, and add the, fil the, the weight right there, and then we know that at least no new builds are gonna try to go there until we sort it out. And so here's a shot from that same management application where you can see a, a cell weighted the other day, um, minus 42, um, based on IPs more than anything. So, Neutron and cells, this will be the very highest level overview of that. Um, but essentially, 
We have Neutron running, and we do run it with cells. That's largely based on the fact that we wrote the Quark plugin. Um, the real drivers for the Quark plugin had a lot more to do with the fact that we, provide, we have multiple provider networks per instance, mm -hmm. by default. Um, we give them a public and a private internal network. Um, also, we bridge those things straight to, to the outside. So when you get a public IP on your instance, it's not going through a firewall or something. It's bridged to the outside. Um, but to, to pull it off with the, with the Quark plugin, and I've got the link there for the code. I'll talk a little bit more about it on, on uh, Thursday, I think. Um, but we, give, we borrowed some ideas from back when we had Quantum and Melange. So we have a tenant for each cell. Um, each cell becomes a segment from the pr perspective of Neutron. Our subnets, which for us represent an IP block, uh, are assigned to those segments. And then Nova will request ports from both the public IP blocks, the private IP blocks, and actually we allocate the max dynamically as well. So it'll pull all those things from, from Neutron based on this setup. So I think, I don't know how much time we have, but. In a couple, one minute, I think. Or one minute, huh? Yeah. So <laughs> one question, though. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, what are some of the major issues you've had facing liability for the For which, in general? In general, the biggest, the biggest issue. Um, so. Yeah, also messaging was probably the most recent one. Uh, it would knock over a rabbit quickly. Um, I mean, from my perspective, we try to pull code quite often. And so usually it's finding the things that weren't tested at any kind of large scale and then figuring out how to deal with those quickly once we've deployed it. But I don't know what you guys would add to that. Same, yeah. So we can talk more offline if you want to. Cool, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Ross.